Hello everybody and welcome back to the ASUS YouTube channel. It's been a pretty busy last couple of weeks here in terms of a number of different products coming to the market and one of them was actually the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 660 Ti. Uh, the Ti is really kind of a sweet spot in terms of the gamers uh, graphics cards really offering a, a high level of performance when you're considering 1080p gaming as well as even 2560 uh, base gaming titles at a much more accessible price point uh, than the really outstanding uh, high performance cards like the GTX 670 and 680. Uh, with that though, NVIDIA's uh, been busy and uh, we've been busy as well as and coming to the market with a brand new graphics card that's actually a bit more accessible in terms of its price point. And this is actually going to be the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 660, so non-TI graphics card. Uh, we're going to be diving into definitely the differentiations in terms of how this product differs from the TI, uh, some of the actual performance metrics in terms of clock speeds, as well as how our non-reference design uh, compares to the actual reference design and even also compares to the higher performing GTX 660 TI graphics card. So with that, let's go ahead and get started and take a look at what comes included with the card. In terms of what we have included inside the box, pretty straightforward. We've got one adapter. This is going to be a DVI to VGA adapter for you guys that need the connectivity for an older legacy monitor. Uh, but keep in mind, in terms of the display output connectivity, we'll be covering that when we take a look at the box as well as the card. Uh, second up, we actually have the quick setup guide. This pretty much has all the information you're going to need on how to actually install the graphics card, as well as some additional information on connections and also some information on the GPU tweak utility itself. Lastly here, we've got our actual software installation disk. This is going to have the graphics driver as well as our GPU tweak graphics card utility. Uh, for the best performance, you always want to make sure to head over to NVIDIA.com and download the latest version of the GeForce driver for your graphics card. Secondary to that, same thing, head over to support.asus.com and make sure you have the latest version of GPU tweaks software available. Uh, but that software is going to allow you to essentially tweak and tune the card, control everything from voltage to clock speeds, as well as customize your fan curve and even check for newer BIOS updates for the graphics cards. So pretty much an all-inclusive utility at tweaking, tuning, and overclocking your card. So with that, let's go ahead and take a look at the box. As you can see right here, we've got the box for the GTX 660 uh, series graphics card. And this card is a full non-reference at launch. That means you won't be seeing any type of reference card design from us in any one of the three flavors that exist. Now you can see right here, we do have a designation noting this is the top card. This is always the highest end of our normal series graphics cards. So there'll be three versions of this card available. The standard, the OC, and the top edition, which we're going to be taking a look at. Now keep in mind in terms of all the physical things that we're going to be covering for this card, they are the same across all three. The only variation is going to be in the clock speed. It being a top card, it's coming in clocked in at 1137 megahertz as well as the memory being a little bit overclocked to 6.1 gigahertz. Uh, it comes of course included with two gigabytes worth of memory. It's featuring our digital power delivery implementation as well as our super alloyed power, power components, which we'll go into more detail when we take a look at the card, and the GPU tweak utility software, which we mentioned earlier, which comes included with the card. And as always, of course, it being direct CU2 means that it comes with our high performance uh, nickel plated copper te technology, which helps to dissipate the heat from the GPU, and of course has two fans and we'll get a little bit more into that when we take apart the card. As you can see right here we've got our ASUS GTX 660 DirectCU 2 series card. Uh, this one specifically is the top. As I noted earlier it's exactly the same in terms of the look and the overall design layout that you're going to have on either the OC model or the standard model. Now in terms of how this differentiates from the uh, GeForce GTX 660 Ti, the main differential is going to come into play in terms of the CUDA cores. So the CUDA cores have been reduced to 960 uh, versus the previous 1344, which was the same amount of CUDA cores that was also on the GTX 670. And the GTX 680 of course had the highest count at 1536. Um, with the GTX 670 and 680 both also featured a 256-bit memory bus, um, while the 660 Ti as well as this card both feature a 192-bit memory bus. Now what that really comes into playing in terms of dictating a different performance marker is going to be taking the card from the GeForce GTX 660 Ti being really, really strong uh, with uh, 1080p based gaming and even uh, 2560 based gaming and higher anti-aliasing available to you while gaming uh, to having this card really being a sweet spot at 1080p. There is going to definitely be the possibility of being able to do some 2560 by 1440 gaming um, assuming that the title doesn't have as much shader intensive 
um, technology built into it, but that's going to really vary kind of game by game. But in most uh, games that you're going to be talking about, especially the current generation of DirectX 11 titles, uh, even ones that are featuring the latest generation of things like Soft Shadows, DirectX 11 technologies like Tessellation, you're going to get really strong performance. So this is really going to be a kind of sweet spot card for people that are considering 1080p based gaming. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and start to take a look at the card, um, how we're bringing our non-reference design aspects, and how it compares to in terms of the reference GTX uh, 660 series card. Okay, right off the bat, you guys can see that you have two fans here that's part of our DC2 design. Um, of course, these two fans are helping to give us a high quality airflow uh, to the heatsink and fan assembly, which is part of the actual direct copper technology that we're utilizing to actually dissipate the heat. Now, in terms of your reference card, your reference card will only be made up of a single fan design, and this will, of course, affect the temperature as well as the acoustics of the card. In our testing, uh, we've had really impressive temperature results where we're essentially able to run this card either at the standard model or even at the top speeds uh, under full gaming load between about 60 to about 62 C. So a very well cooled card and very moderate in terms of the actual temperature increase even when overclocking the card. When you make a comparison to that and only having a single fan uh, list as such as what you're going to have on the reference card, that's going to be significantly hotter looking at an excess of 85 C and also the sound is going to be quite different. This card essentially under full gaming load uh, won't exceed about a 45% uh, profile on the fan curve and only about maybe 1500 to 1600 rpm so this card is essentially going to be inaudible very very quiet about 9 db quieter uh, than the reference card design now the last thing that we want to touch on here in terms of the physical characteristics on the fans themselves is going to be these fans feature our dust proof fan technology so that means actually on the inside underneath this portion right here, the hub assembly, which helps the fan to actually rotate, we've sealed it so that dust, debris, and dander can't get on the inside of there and actually stop the fan blade from spinning. So uh, a really cool technology that you don't necessarily see right off the bat, but really does help to improve the overall lifespan and the reliability of the card, as well as help, help ensure the best long-term cooling performance. So with that, let's go ahead and move over to the other side and take a look at display output connectivity. Here you can see that we've got the display output connectivity, pretty similar to essentially what we're having on the GeForce GTX 660 Ti, 670, and 680 cards, since this is still based off the Kepler core, and we've got some fantastic display output. So essentially you've got two DVI ports, one DVI-D, one DVI-I, you've got a full-size HDMI port and a full-size display port, and keep in mind since it's Kepler based, you get all the full advantages that you would have with that display output connectivity, meaning that you can run three panels as well as a fourth accessory panel, that's a cool thing to keep in mind, especially with Windows 8 coming down the road, where you might be able to want to go ahead and run the start screen on a secondary panel. And also, you're going to have support for even future display output formats, such as 4K. So that's pretty flexible in that regard. And lastly, of course, it being Kepler and supporting 3D Vision, you do have full display output support for 3D Vision, uh, whether it's going to be movies, uh, whether it's going to be photographs, or it's also going to be gaming, and you can drive a, a 3D vision surround setup from one single card. Although ideally, in terms of multi-panel multi configuration gaming, you are going to want to consider uh, two cards, uh, which is also going to be a difference uh, with this card versus the GeForce GTX 660 Ti, which supports up to three-way SLI, while this card is limited to two-way SLI. So with that, let's go ahead and move over to the back of the card, as well as take a look at the interface. So here we've got the back of the card, one of the things you can see right up here at the top is going to actually be a brace. This brace helps to add a bit of rigidity and stabilization to the card once it's inserted inside the chassis. So that's a nice additional touch that you're going to find here on your own reference design. Um, from there, you're also going to, of course, see the SLI uh, connection. And like I noted, this is a card only capable of two-way SLI. From there, of course, you see everything that's pretty standard on the back, uh, including, of course, the PCI Express connectivity. So this is goes into any physical by 16 slot and does support PCI Gen 3 operation. But in terms of performance, whether you're running it in by 16 or by 8, uh, whether it's Gen 3 or Gen 2, you're essentially going to get the same level of performance. So no worries in that regard. Now, one touch that we do want to go ahead and note on here in terms of the center area is going to be that we do have a slight reduction in terms of the pause caps or what's referred to as our super alloy power uh, cap design uh, that helps provide better power delivery to the GPU core when overclocking. Uh, for our higher end cards, we generally feature a four 
uh, pause cap design. This one features two, um, but in our testing, we were still actually able to exceed um, about 150 megahertz in terms of the core boost clock, and even for some cards higher than that, that translated to between about 1275 to even 1300 megahertz. So still very, very solid uh, overclocking results, um, and we're still bringing you this high level of performance even on a more mid-range part, where on a lot of the other cards on the market, they might not even feature um, uh, any type of back-to-back -back, uh, pause cap design, so that's something to keep in mind. Lastly, right here, in terms of the actual power connectivity, you can see that uh, it's a little bit different. This is a significantly lower power-consuming card than your normal uh, graphics card with only one physical six-pin PCI Express power. Its rated TDP is about 140 watts, which is already lower than what the GeForce GTX 660 Ti was. Um, so that does allow you to go ahead and install this into a much more reasonable system in terms of the power supply requirements. But overall, Kepler is outstanding in terms of its power consumption. So really, any card that you're picking, uh, you could probably get away with uh, out any issues having a 500 watt to 600 watt power supply. Um, although, of course, the better quality of the PSU, uh, the better your system will be off with that. We've gone ahead and removed the four screws that affix the back PCB uh, to the actual heatsink and fan assembly. So keep in mind that it's really easy to gain access to the inside of the card. If you ever want to go ahead and maybe blow it out or change out the thermal compound, very simple. So with that, we're just gonna go ahead and twist it up a little bit, kind of like an Oreo cookie. And then from there, open this guy up. And from here, we're going to go ahead and separate these two and go a little bit deeper into the PCB and the onboard power component trees, such as our DG Plus power design and our SCP power, as well as the DirectCU2 heatsink fan assembly. Here you can see we've got the DirectCU2 uh, heatsink and fan assembly pretty much bare. So you can right off the bat see the CU or the copper um, there. Now the different coloring for you guys that don't know is that the, this portion and this portion right here, they're all nickel plated. That's to go ahead and minimize any type of oxidation and to go ahead and help to ensure the best long-term reliability and performance uh, for the heat pipe. And that's something to watch out for. You're gonna see even on other competitors' uh, graphic cards that do use similar technology um, that they're not necessarily taking that time or the additional expense to plate their actual copper heat pipes. So something to watch out for. Of course, in terms of the uh, performance nature of it, you can see we have the direct contact copper technology working to go ahead and remove any of the heat coming off the GPU core, transmits it inside to this, essentially giving us five dissipation points that flow out through the uh, high finned aluminum heatsink assembly, and then of course is aided by the two fans to go ahead and give this really quiet and cool running card. So overall, really an outstanding level of cooling performance that you get with the DirectC2 heats and fan assembly. So with that, let's go ahead and move over to the power design implementation of our card and what separates it from the reference card. Okay guys, here you can see that we've actually got the card directly bare for you. You can see the really nice uh, matte PCB, which uh, while in itself doesn't provide any additional performance enhancements, it just looks really good. Um, but let's go ahead and talk about what actually makes this card different in terms of the reference design. So right off the bat, we're gonna have a difference in the power delivery design implementation. Uh, the reference card is only gonna be using a four-phase power solution, uh, while our ours, we're gonna actually be using a six-phase power solution. Uh, theirs is also a older analog uh, power delivery implementation in terms of the controller, while ours is a digital controller. And what that really means is that you're going to have better accuracy and overall better performance at being able to control aspects of the card when you're overclocking it. And this helps to aid in overall stability as well as the efficiency in terms of the card, uh, which especially for the Kepler architecture, which takes advantage of dynamic uh, GPU clocking and its GPU boost technology to give you better game performance. Uh, this is kind of a key technology to really help us provide you the best level of performance as possible on any one of the GTX uh, 600 series of cards. So let's go ahead and bring in uh, my little assistant here to help me point out some of the uh, characteristics in the VRM area. So the VRM area is this section right here, or the voltage regulation area. So right here you can see that we have the Digi Plus power controller that's on this, uh, this graphics card. Uh, this is the same one that we actually feature on our award-winning motherboards. Here we have our super alloyed capacitors, which are rated at a significantly higher temperature tolerance than normal capacitors. So while other vendors might just communicate that they're using high quality caps, um, these caps actually undergo a special metallurgic process uh, and are actually produced under different levels of pressure and temperatures, which allow them to operate at a much, much longer level in terms of lifespan. Um, they're actually rated for as much as 75 C continuous ambient temperature, uh, whereas many other uh, capacitors are much closer to about 
35 to about 50, maybe 55C. So especially when considering uh, that this card could be going into multi-GPU configurations or, or hotter environments, it's nice to know that the componentry that you have is going to help to give you the best long-term lifespan. Here you can see that we have that high performance chokes or SAP chokes. Uh, these are fully sealed uh, with our alloy based uh, metallurgic process. Um, this helps to not only provide us better lifespan, better performance, but also help to minimize and almost eliminate any type of choke whine, which sometimes can be heard on the cards as they're undergoing gaming load. So you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, chokes essentially giving us that six phase power design. And the last portion of the SAP power component tree is going to be the MOSFETs. So the capacitors, chokes, and then MOSFETs. These are very high performance MOSFETs that are tinier, uh, tinier in terms of their physical package, uh, helps to minimize the heat output, improve the power efficiency, as well as be able to drive higher levels of voltage for better overclocking stability. Um, so overall, really the best of the best in terms of the power component tree you can get on a graphics card. Um, we're also gonna have a little bit more pause caps total on this card, three versus one on the reference. Now, for you guys that might be wondering that you've seen on our other higher end cards where we do have a VRM heatsink, we don't have one on this card uh, just to reduce the cost a little bit, but due to the high performance MOSFETs that we're utilizing, you can definitely still feel confident that you can overclock this card, and we've done so without any stability issues at all. Um, and you are still receiving airflow from the DC2 design where you're getting airflow coming in from the uh, card fan that would be right about here, still blowing down to help to aid in the dissipation area for this. Now, one last point that we do want to touch on here that is not part of the DG Plus power design um, or the SAP power componentry uh, touches back to some LEDs that we have uh, layered here, but actually touch onto the back of the card. And uh, this is going to be a cool little design implementation that lets you know that when you connect the graphics card, the actually LEDs will light uh, green to let you know that you've made actually a clean connection, the card is receiving power, and if you didn't make a clean connection or there's some type of power issue going on, it actually will light red. So another nice touch in terms of the non-reference design aspect of our card. All right, guys, we've pretty much broken down the card for you, giving you a perspective in terms of how it differentiates itself uh, from the TI series graphics card, as well as from the reference series card. So kind of putting, you know, a bow on this and kind of giving you a little bit of perspective at if you guys are interested in picking this card up, you know, once again, this is really kind of the gamer sweet spot at a 1080p base card. Works really well if you're one of those users out that is still rocking, you know, a 8000 series card, like an 8600 GT, 8800 GT, 9800 GT, uh, GT 260, even GTX, um, you know, 460 part, and even from the previous generation, maybe you're running uh, actually, you know, uh, a GTX 560 part or even a TI part. This is going to still be an outstanding value if you take a look at the entire picture. Minimum frame rate increase is going to be quite a bit more stable. It's going to be much more consistent than it was with previous generation cards. You're going to have an outstanding power efficiency. Great acoustics, the card's essentially going to be inaudible, uh, you know, and the temperatures are going to be outstanding. You know, as we were talking about earlier, temperature performance from the DC2 design, you're really talking about low temperatures, somewhere between about 60 to about 62C, and that's even when considering overclocking, which this card, even with it only utilizing one six pin power connection and being a, a, about a default TDP of about 140 watts, uh, you're, you're definitely going to be able to overclock this card and be able to get higher and higher levels of performance. And then when you consider that, of course, you still have that option of enabling uh, two-way SLI support, as you see here on our test bed that we've set up, uh, you're even going to get that much better performance when you consider the scaling that SLI has, the work that NVIDIA is doing in their drivers, and the overall performance that you're going to get at being able to enable a higher level of image quality, uh, whether that's tessellation, whether that's advanced level anti-aliasing like TXXXA, FXXAA, uh, SAF Shadows, or any of those really cool image quality enhancements that you're seeing in a lot of the new cutting edge titles on the market. Uh, so for you guys, you know, that are interested uh, in finding out more information, you know, make sure and check out the other videos that we offer on the channel. If you have any questions or comment, make sure to drop them on here too. I take a lot of time to feed back to you guys as well. And as always, if you want more information, stay tuned to our Facebook and Twitter pages as well. And if you enjoyed the video, please make sure and subscribe so we can keep bringing you cool content.